Adelante. Hello. Yes. Yes. Okay. Oh, oh, one place. Yes. Okay. We are recording. Okay. Thank you very much. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for being here again for this uh, new another uh, colloquium from the Severo Choa program. Uh, today we have the pleasure of having here Dr. Shane O'Sullivan. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much uh, for having accepted our invitation to be here today. Um, and thank you all of uh, all, all of you for being here as well, here on and or online. Shane O'Sullivan is a radio astronomer working at the University uh, Complutense de Madrid under the program Atracción de Talento Investigador from the uh, regional government in Madrid. He got his PhD in, in 2010 from University College Cork in Ireland on the topic of VLBI observations of AGM jets. Uh, he spent five years as a postdoc in Australia on science related to the uh, ASCAP POSOM survey, where POSOM means uh, polarization survey on the, of the universe's magnetism. Since then, he has worked in UNAM, Mexico uh, City, Hamburg Observatory, and Dublin City University. He works on understanding radio galaxies, the cosmic web, and the origin of cosmic magnetic fields. He's the co-PI of the LOFAR Magnetism Key Science Project. And today, as you know, he's talking about the magnetized intergalactic medium revealed by the SKA by finders. Thank you again, um, Shane, and, and welcome. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the very nice introduction. Yes, so so today I will talk um, about the yeah trying to constrain the properties of the intergalactic medium and its magnetic field through radio telescope observations with these amazing new um, pathfinder and precursor telescopes we have in advance of the, the square kilometer array. And before I start, I'd like to just acknowledge the huge amount of work of many people over many years. Um, um, which is the will be the basis of some of the results I present here um, within the LOFAR surveys and magnetism key science projects. And also towards the end, hopefully I'll show um, some of the new results from this um, ASCAP, so this Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder Telescope and um, a new survey that's, that's, um, um, that's recently started. Okay, so I was wondering when the last time I was in Granada, and yeah, interestingly, it was um, exactly 11 years ago to the day that I also gave a talk <laughs> at this um, very nice um, AGN Jets meeting organized by Jose Luis Gomez and others. Um, and yeah, so I have very nice memories of this, um, uh, of this, the last time I was in Granada, visited lots of um, nice places and um, yeah, the conference was um, a really, really great, really great meeting. Okay, but today, so um, I'll be talking about things on larger scales, um, or on the large scale, the largest scales in the universe. And just to start with, um, I wanted to give some kind of big picture kind of motivation without maybe much explanation at the start, but hopefully as I go through the talk, things will become um, clearer. Um, and so what we've been finding recently is that through this, the use of this um, Faraday relation um, um, effect, um, we're actually able to trace um, or finding it to be quite a sensitive tracer of um, the, the large scale matter outside of, you know, the, the halos of galaxies in the, in the cosmic web. Um, and so um, there's been yeah, a, a, a few recent publications showing how you can use Faraday rotation to trace ionized and therefore magnetized gas in the, the, the outskirts of clusters. Um, and also at the interface between the intergroup medium and the intergalactic medium. Um, and we've also excitingly um, found some signature of the circumgalactic medium um, in, in nearby galaxies. And this is important because it helps actually constrain these, um, these impressive MHD, you know, cosmological simulations and galaxy simulations on scales that um, are not very well constrained um, to date. So beyond the actual, you know, stellar disks and halos of galaxies, um, so that we can hopefully provide some, some new constraints on these models to actually help um, better characterize the circumgalactic medium as well as the, the intergalactic medium and the effect of 
galaxy and AGN outflows on the, the large scale structure of the universe. Okay, and that's one key motivation. The other one then is actually studying the magnetized properties of um, filaments and voids of the cosmic web to actually try to infer the, the origin of cosmic magnetism. So whether it was there from very early on in the universe or whether it's mainly been um, produced on small scales later in the in, in the universe and then expelled um, into the intergalactic medium. And this has quite, you know, very interesting uh, implications if there are strong primordial magnetic fields, uh, because it gives us a unique insight into the um, the physics of the very early universe. So, for example, if the, the fields were generated during the epoch of inflation, then we have this kind of unique probe of, of the, that period of the universe that's otherwise very difficult um, to, to study. And what's exciting is that if you do produce um, primordial magnetic fields in the very early universe, it can also produce the, the same art, consistent at least with the production of these gravitation wave background that I guess is normally attributed to supermassive black hole binary systems. And the same magnetic fields that produce this stochastic, wave, or stochastic gravitation wave background can also potentially alleviate this Hubble tension that you may have heard a lot about um, by actually um, the presence of these magnetic fields means that recombination occurs a little bit earlier and this um, um, helps then to actually push the Hubble constant to a larger value that's more consistent with the local universe measurements. And then, yeah, once if you have these magnetic fields um, um, produced before structure formation, then they actually influence, they change the matter power spectrum on the, on the small scales. And this can lead to the production of uh, more dwarf galaxies than, than, than normal, so that it affects the, the whole history of, of reionization as well. So these are kind of two of the main um, motivations for, for why it's, yeah, it's interesting to try and constrain the properties of the, um, the cosmic web on these large scales. And so we, we know a lot from simulations, or at least we think we know a lot, um, based our, on, on how matter is distributed in the universe. So all our measurements are usually confined to the, you know, quite close to galaxies, at least in the local universe. Um, but we know that the majority of normal matter actually exists beyond, um, you know, beyond galaxies in the, um, in the um, filaments and voids of the cosmic web. So it's just this diffuse ionized gas, mainly in the local universe, you know, just filling, um, filling this cosmic web. Um, um, yes, and evolving kind of yeah with along with the the collapse of these of these structures. And then what we've been finding in recent years that yes, this large scale structure is actually appreciably magnetized. And so both from measurements of um, um, synchrotron radiation of accretion shocks in these these filaments, as well as Faraday rotation measurements um, implying the existence of magnetic fields in these filaments. And also from gamma ray observations, it appears that the, the voids of the cosmic web are, are also magnetized. And so then the question arises, what's its origin? So how were these um, fields actually produced in the first place? So it's very difficult for a galaxy to pollute a whole void um, um, of the universe um, with, with magnetic fields. And so most people are, the yeah, consensus maybe to date is that it's most likely that there's quite a, um, a significant primordial um, field that has um, produced um, um, or that has yeah, um, produced the, the magnetic fields we see in voids, possibly in filaments. Uh, and then um, we have to understand what the contribution of um, galaxy and AGN outflows then are to these, these, um, these regions as well. Okay, and so in terms of um, numbers of what we what we understand to date, so we have some upper limits on the the co-moving magnetic field strength at the um, the epoch of um, recombination, and so from these anisotropies in the CMB um, temperature map, you can constrain the magnetic field on megaparsec scales to be less than a few nanogauss, and so these are pretty robust upper limits on on the uh, the strength of magnetic fields in that epoch. And then excitingly, you know, in the last 10 years or so, uh, people have found that you can provide lower limits 
So that really saying that the universe is magnetized on the larger scales from these very high energy gamma ray measurements from, from lasers. And so this is a pretty neat process where you have these high energy um, tera electron volts and tera electron volt gamma rays that um, pair produce off the extra galactic background light. And then these pairs scatter or upscatter the CMB photons to giga electron volt energies. And so then you expect this um, excess of giga electron volt gamma rays associated with these TEV sources. However, this is not seen or not seen to the level uh, that's expected. And so the implication then is that these electron positron pairs, when they're created, are actually deflected away from our line of sight by the actual magnetic field in these voids. And so then you can put an upper limit of, say, 10 to the minus 7 nanogauss, or sorry, lower limit of 10 to the minus 7, 7 nanogauss in these voids. Right. And so, and then the way, so, okay, this is quite a large um, range of uncertainty. So we have seven orders of magnitude, um, you know, unconstrained parameter space. But how we actually distinguish between primordial and what we call astrophysical mechanisms for the origin of cosmic magnetism. By astrophysical, I just mean that the fields are created on small scales, amplified within stars, galaxies, and then ejected into the intergalactic medium. So it's kind of like a pollution of the intergalactic medium from these astrophysical sources. All right, and the, the magnetic field, measuring the magnetic field then on these larger scales is actually key to distinguish between the two scenarios. Because yeah, we have lots of nice measurements of the magnetic field in galaxies and galaxy clusters, but then we're lacking information um, on, in, on scales of filaments and voids, whereas the astrophysical scenario, you expect the magnetic field strength to fall off quite quickly away from these overdense structures. Um, but for a primordial field, then you expect that there is appreciably larger um, signature of these magnetic fields in the, the voids and filaments. And so this is how we hope to distinguish between these two scenarios. Uh, okay, and before I go too much into the details, I guess maybe it's not necessary here, but just to give you um, um, a brief overview of how we are studying magnetic fields with radio telescopes. So one of the key mm -hmm. mechanisms is um, by using synchrotron radiation. So this is this very beautiful 4NXA radio galaxy. The orange here is the radio synchrotron emission. Um, this is the host galaxy here in the optical. And so we know that we have appreciable magnetic fields in these radio galaxies because they're um, producing the synchrotron radiation where you have these relativistic electrons um, spiraling along um, or around magnetic field lines and producing this uh, synchrotron radiation, which gives us information about the magnetic field in the plane of the sky. But for this talk, unfortunately, I'm not going to be studying the details of these radio sources or saying much about them. We're just using them as sources of linearly polarized radiation. So synchrotron radiation happens to be highly linearly polarized. So for the purposes of this talk, we're just using them as sources of this linear polarization, which allows us to measure the Faraday rotation all the, all the way along the line of sight. So we have our, our source of, of linearly polarized radiation. And then once you pass through a region of ionized and magnetized gas, you encounter this effect of Faraday rotation, where the amplitude of the effect is related to the rotation measure, which depends on the free electron densities and the magnetic field um, along your line of sight. So this is a, a Faraday rotation measure map of the same radio galaxy. You can see that there's lots of small scale structure here that's actually associated with the source itself. So the interaction between the source magnetic field and its environment. Um, but but for, the, for this talk, we're mainly um, interested in just the average magnetic field, or sorry, the average Faraday rotation, which tells us about the magnetic field properties uh, along the line of sight. And so one of the key goals for, um, well, eventually the SKA, but also SKA pathfinders is to produce this Faraday rotation measure grid. So just you have as many Faraday rotation measures um, as you can measure across the sky. So finding as many polarized, uh, linearly polarized radio galaxies as you can and then um, converting these beautiful radio galaxies into little circles. So just taking you know, where you detect the polarized emission and then taking the average Faraday rotation of that single source. And then you have this whole map or grid across the sky of your Faraday rotation measure. And we use this for you know, as a statistical probe of um, foreground Faraday rotating structures. 
Okay, and so there's two yeah, main regimes, I guess, where we construct these Faraday rotation measure grids. Uh, historically, it's been, mainly been done at centimeter wavelengths where it's easier to measure the, the polarization of sources and their associated Faraday rotation. Um, and as I'll talk hopefully in towards the end about this new survey um, with the Australian SKA Pathfinder, which is finding an incredible 30 to 50 Faraday rotation measures per square degree, whereas in the best um, previous large area survey provided about one rotation measure per square degree. And there, there's also a very good error in the Faraday rotation of 1.5 radians per meter squared. This probably doesn't mean too much to you now, but hopefully later. But these centimeter wavelength observations provide a really yeah, broad um, opportunity to study magnetic fields in a wide range of environments. But most of my talk is going to be studied on um, constructing Faraday rotation measure grids at meter wavelengths. So this is relatively new. So just in the last few years, we realized we could do this and that it was scientifically useful to do it. Um, and so with this low far two meter sky survey, um, we're finding about 0.5 RMs per square degree. So a much lower density. But the key point here that enables us to actually do unique science is um, that the uncertainty in these rotation measure values are then very, very small um, at these meter wavelengths. And this turns out to be a very key, a key probe of these very um, diffuse and, and weakly magnetized environments, such as the, the um, filaments of this cosmic web. Okay, so the basic idea of the experiment that I'll be talking about is we use, we have these bright sources of linearly polarized radio emission, so this radio galaxy at some redshift, and then as it's the light propagates through the intergalactic medium. So it encounters some region, some filament of the cosmic web that has a certain gas density and a magnetic field. And then it encounters some Faraday rotation. And then it might pass through many filaments. And it's just, it's the integral of all these contributions along the line of sight. And so how we measure it is in the change in this linear polarization angle is proportional to the, or is equal to the Faraday rotation measure and the, the wavelength squared, right? And so we, yeah, mm -hmm. for any one radio galaxy, we can't distinguish, you know, what's happening along the line of sight. But so we 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 aim to do this in a statistical sense with many of these these sources. Okay, mm -hmm. so to give you some context on, you know, what um, a particular value of the rotation measure actually means. Um, so if we're looking at these intergalactic filaments, then what's the um, typical value? So if we take um, a, a particular overdensity for these cosmic web filaments and a particular path length and um, a magnetic field strength, then we end up with something of order one rating per meter squared. So this is the type of um, um, value that one would expect um, for the contribution of filaments um, of the cosmic web. So yeah, it's relatively small in the sense of how we measure um, Faraday rotation and what our typical uncertainties were. But if you remember from the, the previous slide or two slides ago, the uncertainty with low far is much smaller um, than it was with the centimeter telescopes. Because one rating per meter squared, so it rotates the linear polarization angle by about two degrees at centimeter wavelengths. And so that's measurable, but it's challenging. But at meter wavelengths, because if the effect goes as wavelength squared, you actually rotate the polarization angle by 200 degrees. So this means it's just much easier to measure very small Faraday rotation measure values and you get much um, higher precision. Okay, and this is so, this is why we want to use this SK pathfinder known as the low frequency array or LOFAR. And so hopefully you've already heard of, of LOFAR. Oh, can I get this? So this is a pan-European radio interferometer um, operating at very low frequencies or at meter wavelengths. Um, and so to date, we've mainly been using the data just from the inner 100 kilometers. Um, so this, all the stations within the Netherlands. Um, but in the future, we hope to actually use the full power of the array to, to, to image at the highest, the highest angular resolution. And so we have these large um, collaborations. Um, so the the, key, the magnetism key science project and the surveys key science project in terms of the continuum the continuum imaging of these of these data sets. Right, and the 
the, the, main, the main project here, or the main survey is this low power two meter sky survey. Um, so it's operating, or the survey is operating from 100, around 150 megahertz um, and is a very sensitive um, radio survey for, for typical radio galaxies that have these deep spectral indices. I'm sorry, I didn't explain that at all, but for typical radio galaxies, um, LOPS is very sensitive and comparable to these SK Pathfinder telescopes at centimeter wavelengths. So this, this red and blue line means a typical, the spectrum of a typical radio source. And so we've had a data release two. Um, so the, the aim is to cover the whole Northern sky, but we've had a data release two, which is about 27% of the Northern sky. Um, and we're mainly avoiding the galactic plane because it's very difficult to, to produce images there. Okay, and so these we have these two fields. The data are publicly available, so you can see the um, the LOFAR surveys um, webpage and the associated publications that not only give you the radio information but also um, the the multi wavelength information associated with each of these radio sources. And yeah, impressive four point four million total intensity radio sources are cataloged. Um, and for, for my particular interest, the bright ones are the ones that are detectable in polarization. So there's about 1 million or so of those. Um, but we only find about 2,500 linearly polarized sources. So it's a lot of work to, to search through the whole, um, the whole survey to find only 2,500 um, sources. So this means only 0.2% are detectable. But thankfully, with this 0.2% um, that we detect, we can actually do um, interesting science because of this excellent um, precision. Okay, and the survey is continuing. So if you know if your object of interest lies outside this publicly released data, then please do get in touch. And it's probably advanced a bit more. By the end of the year, we will have covered um, the basically the whole northern extragalactic sky, just minus the some regions of the galactic plane. And that will be part of the data release three. Okay, and so what I've been doing for the last number of years is to then, yeah, do this rotation measure grid for this low power two meter sky survey. Um, and so, yeah, we've taken these beautiful, oh yeah, these beautiful radio galaxies as shown in the bottom right here, and some portion of that radio galaxy will be linearly polarized and we can measure its Faraday rotation. And then we represent it by one of these small little circles. Um, and so each of these circles corresponds yeah, to this Faraday rotation measure where the, the size of the circle corresponds to the magnitude and the color corresponds to the sign. So we're sensitive to the actual line of sight and the net line of sight uh, magnetic field direction from this Faraday rotation as well. Oh yeah, so this is just a zoom in view. Oh yeah, so here you can see the, the different sizes of the circle and the, the Faraday rotation measure values they correspond to. And so what you can probably see immediately with your eyes is you have these large coherent patches of sign so you have these, you know, this very nice blue kind of filament that's coming along here. And so this is representing the, the, the dominant mean contribution or, um, from the, the Milky Way inter magnetized interstellar medium. And so to study the extragalactic um, uh, variety rotation, we actually have to remove this, what we call the galactic rotation measure. And so we do this with, you know, a model. We have this a model basically that uses the variety rotation measure and smooth them on large scales. Um, and we hope that then this actually accurately removes the dominant or the main contribution from, from the Milky Way. And all that we're left with is this residual variety rotation or this residual rotation measure, um, which um, should be dominated by the extra galactic component. And you can see that now all the nice patterns have gone away and you just have this kind of, yeah, um, random in, in the sense of the line of sight component um, across the sky. And so we yeah, have what this looks like in a histogram. So the colors are just the different, the different fields um, because they're in different areas of the galaxy. So you just have some initial distribution of RMs that's related mainly to the Milky Way. We subtract the Milky Way model, and then we have the residual extragalactic Faraday rotation and distribution left, which has a mean of zero. And the and a finite dispersion. And this dispersion is what we do our science with. So we're looking for the actual dispersion um, associated with extragalactic um, uh, magnetic fields. Okay, and so yeah, luckily um, this data set is actually useful for, for different types of studies. So studying the actual radio galaxies themselves, 
um, finding new pulsars. So there's a few highly polarized compact sources that turn out to be pulsars in this um, area of sky that weren't known before. But then most of the studies, at least that um, I've been involved with, um, are studying the the, yeah. the the magnetized properties of the extragalactic universe. Ah, yes, and so we continue to process the data. Um, and so hopefully, you know, early next year, we'll actually have pretty much the whole northern extragalactic sky priority rotation measure grid as part of this data release three. Right, yes. So, yeah, so it's exciting that we'll have a data set maybe two to three times larger than what I'm going to present in the rest of these slides. <clears throat> oh, and just in case you'd like to see some of the radio galaxies and what the polarized ones look like. So this is just a standard low far field, about 16 square degrees on the sky, a single, single eight hour observation. And then the contours give you the synchrotron um, emitting um, total intensity contours of the radio source. And then the pick color pixels are the region of the source that has detectable or detected polarization and it's associated with variety rotation. So you see the most of them, the polarization is actually detected from the extremities and they look like these far enough Riley type two radio galaxies. But it's not exclusively those and um, laser still sneak in there and there's a few FO ones as well. Okay, and in terms of if you're interested in downloading the catalog and using um, the data for your own science, um, so we do have a whole load of columns that you know provide some um, additional information, such as the the linear size of the sources, their luminosities, um, some effort to automatically cl classify their morphologies. Um, so you can pick out maybe just the compact sources or just the extended ones. But the majority of ones that are polarized um, are, are 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 resolved. So they're these nice double low gradient galaxies. Ah, yes, and then, of course, we put huge effort into actually identifying the host galaxies and finding redshifts for these sources, because this is really enables us to, to do our science. And so the polarized sources are the brightest ones, so they're more or easier to identify the host galaxy um, because of this exceptional um, image fidelity that LOFAR actually provides as well. So it recovers both the diffuse emission of the lobes as well as the, the compact emission. So it makes it much easier to identify the host galaxy. Yeah, that's a nice example that the host is here. Right, and so the median redshift is about 0.6. This is including the photometric ones. They're usually large radio galaxies, a median size of 400 kiloparsecs, and mm -hmm. quite luminous, you know, above this FR1, FR2 luminosity threshold at 150 megahertz. And yeah, if you're interested in blazars, you know, there's there's interesting sources here where you actually not only are you detecting the core of the blazar, but actually the extended, you know, um, kiloparsec scale jets and 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 lobes in some cases. All right, yeah, and more new pulsars. Okay, so then for the this second part of the talk is to focus on the science and just some of the recent results using this catalog. Um, uh, mainly this um, work of Heeson et al. and and a series of papers by Ettore Coretti. And then towards the end, I'll mention the, the possum results. Okay, so the first um, neat um, result was actually detecting the magnetized CGM in, uh, in a bunch of nearby galaxies. So again, doing this statistically, we have our, you know, a whole, a whole sample of galaxies, and then we have some impact parameter of the rotation measure to this galaxy. And then we're trying to see if there's a signature of the Faraday rotation as a function of this impact parameter. Right, yeah, so 183 nearby galaxies selected from this Palomar sample. So they're all within uh, 100 megaparsec um, from, from us. Ah, yes. And then the key plot here that I'll take a few minutes just to e explain. So always what we're looking for is this, you know, this excess in RM dispersion, you know, Com um, from a particular target or series of targets versus like a control or just the background level. And so, okay, yeah, you have the arm dispersion and then this azimuthal angle is the actual azimuthal angle um, of the, the nearby galaxy. So uh, an azimuthal angle of zero means the impact parameter is along the minor axis of the galaxy uh, and 90 along the major axis. And so beyond impact parameters of 100 kiloparsecs, um, it doesn't matter. The, 
oh yes, beyond, oh yeah, the blue and the black here, the excess or the RM dispersion is the same for all azimuthal angles. And this RM dispersion actually matches, you know, the actual background. So there's no, you know, associ association of excess Faraday rotation related to the galaxies. But then within 100 kiloparsec and at small azimuthal angles, you see an excess of the Faraday rotation um, over the actual background level. And so it's this excess, so the difference between this red point and the blue and black points here is what we're saying is associated with the CGM of this nearby of these nearby galaxies in a statistical sense. Right. And so this rotation measure excess of about four radians per meter squared then corresponds to about 0.5 microgauss at you know, say a distance of 50 kiloparsecs from the, the disk of the galaxy. Um, and so this is interesting because we think we are now probing these magnetized outflows that are preferentially along the minor axis of the galaxy. And so this gives us um, a nice probe of, you know, this, this baryon cycle or these, these inflows and outflows that are expected um, 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 around, you know, all, all galaxies. Right. And so, yeah, you, there's, you know, simulations of these magnetized CGMs. And then what we think we're probing is these magnetized winds and outflows. Um, and, and this is very helpful because there's, there's not that many, you know, observational constraints of the properties of the CGM. So it helps constrain these, these, these simulations quite well. Okay. And so then jumping from nearby galaxies to the largest um, scales to these cosmic web filaments, um, we, we then do this, a similar statistical study. So using the same, the same RM data set, but now we have, you know, we're using the redshift of the sources and we're using, you know, um, a thousand of these where we have spectroscopic redshifts. And so what we're looking for now is an excess in the RM dispersion associated with cosmic web filaments. Um, right. And so this plot on the right here, it shows, so every blue dot here corresponds to one of these 1000 sources and their redshift. And then the y-axis is the actual number of filaments intersected by those lines of sight. So from the radio galaxy along the line of sight, say for this one, you know, there's zero filaments identified from these um, optical spectroscopic catalogs. Whereas in the, these higher redshifts, then you're, you're crossing, you know, 20 or 30 um, filaments as identified in these, in these catalogs. And so then, yeah, we want to look at how the Faraday rotation dispersion changes as a function of redshift of our sample, knowing the number of filaments that are crossing these, um, that this radiation is crossing. And so we have some theoretical expectations for how the priority rotation measure dispersion should increase, and we can parameterize it in a very simple manner. And, and this is, yeah, one of the, the early results where we looked at the dispersion as a function of redshift. And there's a bit of a caveat here that we're now assuming essentially that all of the, the Faraday rotation is dominated by the Faraday rotation from the intergalactic medium. We have other, yeah, other evidence to suggest this is not a bad um, assumption, but this allows us then to actually fit this very simple model to, to the, the observed data as a function of redshift to actually determine what say the characteristic um, or RM contribution is of an individual filament. And so the best fit result here shown by the orange line um, gives um, 0.7 radians per meter squared as the, you know, a contribution on average from, from one filament. And so then we can do a back of the envelope calculation for a particular um, cosmic web filament density and path length through this filament um, and find a magnetic field strength in these filaments of um, of order 30 nanoglass. Right, so this is already um, exciting, but then we can, this is a very, very simple calculation, but then we can do like semi-analytic models for the actual density distribution um, through the, along the line of sight through the universe, as well as using um, results from cosmological, you know, MHD simulations. But they all return somewhat similar results. So depending on the actual exact model we use, you can go from 10 to 40 nanogauss co-moving. So this at, at redshift zero for the magnetic field strength of these filaments. Okay, I mentioned that we assume that the majority of the signal comes from the intergalactic medium. So we have some strong evidence for this in terms of you know, comparing our observations with, with observations at centimeter wavelengths, where 
we and and looking at what objects or what structures exist along the line of sight of our particular targets. And so the majority of the low far polarized sources avoid galaxy cluster environments. So less than 10% actually fall within the virial radius of a galaxy cluster that happens to be along the line of sight. So this is one of the reasons why we don't see as many polarized sources at low frequencies is because of an effect known as depolarization, which just removes the polarized signal if it happens to pass through some dense region of the universe along the line of sight. So LOFAR is providing us with this filter of, you know, um, for dense regions of the universe, so we're only seeing the quite under-dense regions. And then we have other um, ways of studying um, what's happening local to the radio galaxy. So you, I showed you this 4NX A image at the start, which had this very nice, um, you know, um, complicated RM structure. Um, and, and we believe that this is less than 50%, this local to the source contribution is less than 50% to the total RM dispersion that, that we measure. Okay, and now once we have this understanding, now we want to compare this more closely with cosmological MHD simulations that have different um, 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 assumptions for the origin of cosmic magnetic fields. Right, and we do the same sort of filtering, so we, we don't um, select lines of sight that pass through a cluster in these simulations, so we, we fix it to a certain um, over density. Okay, and so this is the the result, which is a very complicated plot. I need to maybe remove some of these lines, um, but I'll, I'll go through it again. On the y-axis, we have this RM dispersion as a function of redshift. And now the black points are the data points from LOFAR, but with this local uh, contribution subtracted. So we believe that these black points, um, as accurately as we can, represent the contribution from cosmic web filaments um, along the line of sight. And so there's, yeah, the black points are the data, and then the other colored points are the results of, you know, doing the same analysis, but through these, using sidelines through these MHD simulations. And then there's a whole series of models which we compare to for the origin of, of cosmic magnetism. So one is that you have a large scale uniform field in the very early universe. And then you just evolve this passively through structure formation. So the field gets larger as things, as, um, uh, as um, through collapsing structures and gets weaker in the expanding voids. And so the gray points here are the prediction from the simulation for a uniform um, primordial magnetic field. And so you can see immediately that this is in conflict with the actual data at the higher redshifts. So for this particular model, oh, for this particular model, it has a seed field of 0.1 nanogauss in the early universe. We can rule this out. And so this is interesting if you so remember from the first slide where I, or one of the first slides where I showed the limits from the cosmic microwave background. So now we believe we're doing better than the limits from the cosmic microwave background, that we can actually rule out things about 10 times, our magnetic field strings about 10 times lower than, than this. Um, yes, and, and then there's many other models here. So all these ones with this alpha S are parameterization of the power spectrum of the primordial magnetic field. Um, these astrophysical ones mean that it's dominated by just outflows from galaxies. So you have basically zero magnetic field in the early universe. You have some battery mechanism that generates fields on small scales. This is amplified by some dynamos and things within galaxies and clusters and then eject it into the intergalactic medium. And so this is what these the astrophysical ones describe. And so, um, yes, and so these, this uh, purple and brown ones um, are, are these, these curves here. So they can roughly match the, um, the effect at low redshifts because now these structures have enough time to evolve and to pollute the environment um, so that in, in the local universe, you know, they're, they've ex ex expanded their influence um, to quite large scales. But in the early universe, they just haven't had time to do this, and they don't, um, they underpredict the amount of fire rotation that one would expect. And so most evidence is now pointing towards these um, primordial magnetic field scenarios as being the ones consistent with, the, with our observations. And so this one is, this um, blue one with a particular power, uh, 
spectrum behavior, which is kind of more towards the side of some inflationary mechanism. So um, where you have most of the magnetic energy on the large scales is the, are these negative indices, and the positive indices are most of the magnetic field um, energy is on the smaller scales initially. And so the one that's most consistent here, the blue one, um, yeah, the pink one is pretty much the same, uh, except it has this included contribution of the astrophysical scenario, which you can't really see, but pro 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 provides an excess here at low redshift over the blue one. Yeah. But yeah, and then we can say that this is um, consistent with a primordial field of um, 0.4 nanogauss, you know, an RMS value on, on megaparsec um, for a megaparsec scale coherence link. And so these astrophysical scenarios, at least in these simulations, are, are disfavored. And, and yeah, excitingly, it looks like um, these primordial fields are, are, yeah, good candidates for the origin of cosmic light. Okay, I want before I move from low fire to ASCAP, I just wanted to mention very briefly that we have this um, uh, low fire is actually currently undergoing an upgrade, um, and so early next year we we plan to start this low fire two era, um, where we the lot survey um, will be mostly finished, and we'll be trying to move to new new surveys over the next five years, um, and this ILOTS is one of the proposed surveys to actually do a similar survey to lots, but instead of at a resolution of six arc seconds, we will have a resolution of 0.3 arc seconds over the whole extragalactic sky. So then we'll have matched resolution images with, with the likes of you know, the optical um, space uh, missions like, like Euclid. And this would be by far the deepest um, and highest resolution wide area radio survey ever. So basically we would resolve, because of this resolution, we would resolve basically all AGN jets on kiloparsec scales, while still be sensitive to diffuse emission. So LOFAR is this incredible imaging um, instrument where you can recover all of these diffuse filamentary structures of radio galaxies, but also have the resolution to, to, to image, you know, these very bright, um, bright regions as well. And we, yeah, we're hoping we will find more polarized sources um, because we have demonstrated that this is possible at the highest resolution but it's still TBD to see yeah, how many more sources we will actually find. Right, and in the northern sky, we do have the access to these um, very good optical spectroscopic um, catalogs and surveys, so we can really do a lot of, of good science with the, the radio galaxies. Okay, and just to finish with, I will mention the Australian Square Kilometer A Pathfinder. So this is um, in particular, so this is at centimeter wavelengths with a very large field of view, so it surveys the sky very quickly. And in particular, the polarization survey um, is ongoing, and so for the next um, the next few years until 2028. And we're surveying basically the whole southern sky. Um, so about 20,000 square degrees at a 20 arc second resolution, and now we expect to get up to 1 million rotation measures. So LOFAR is struggling with its 2,500, but this gets 1 million. And so one of the neat early results from Possum, so using you know, less than 10% of the, 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 the survey um, and studying um, 55 um, galaxy groups um, we're in, the, yeah, in the local universe, um, so at low redshifts and with you know, this particular range in, in mass, and just as they happen to overlap with you know, the kind of random observing pattern. So the, the blue means these are the data that have been um, publicly released and are accessible to the, the collaboration. And so again, we do the same sort of experiment, but now we're using galaxy groups and a separation or a distance um, criteria from these um, galaxy groups. So this flashback radius is basically um, um, yeah, giving you um, a radius of extent of you know, the gravitational influence of these, um, um, of these galaxy groups. And then we're plotting the RM dispersion as a function of this radius. And then, yeah, the background here is a similar background as we mentioned before. Um, and so we're looking for excesses over this background. And so what's neat here is that within these first couple of splashback radii, we have this excess over the background. And this, we believe, is related to the hot intergroup medium um, with this particular level. But then even more excitingly is that we think we're also seeing 
the actual cosmic web filaments that are feeding into this galaxy, these galaxy groups. So on these larger splashback radii, outside the burial radii of the groups, we also find an excess, um, um, about four, four sigma here. And so this, we believe this means that we're looking at this kind of yeah, denser region of the warm and hot intergalactic medium of these filaments feeding into these galaxy groups. And so then we can, yeah, with some simple calculations, we can estimate then that we're seeing magnetic field strengths ranging from about a microgauss in the hot intergroup medium out to you know a tenth of a microgauss in these these filaments feeding into the um, into the groups. And so the idea from you know simulations here is you have these dark matter halos for the the group. You have this hot medium, um, you know, out to some. Um, fraction of the, the virial radius are a bit larger. And then you have these filaments of the, the cooler, um, warm, hot intergalactic medium feeding these galaxy groups. And so this is really exciting to be able to see this now with centimeter wavelengths uh, as well for you know a small sample of objects. And just if people are interested, so this is a very open and a very friendly collaboration, and we're only getting started. So if you're interested in using um, uh, um, our data for, for your science, please do get in touch. You can find details at this possumsurvey.org. And so now we've up to about 200,000 RMs, which is, um, yeah, at least four times more RMs than have been detected in the history of radio astronomy. So already within one year, we have, you know, a huge advance in, um, in our um, capability of studying the magnetized universe. And this shows you what's currently available if you get in touch. So we have this bunch of fields and these colors just indicate the Faraday rotation measure of these fields just randomly scattered um, throughout the observing footprint. So here is your galactic plane where you see an excess in the Faraday rotation measure and then your higher galactic latitudes with lower amplitudes. Right, and there's also uh, a spice racks one. So it's much shallower observations, but it will go up to plus 50 declination, whereas in possum just goes to declination zero. So spice racks will have this large overlap with low fire, and so I'm particularly interested in that. And so there's a public data release one of 13,000 square degrees, but the data release two will cover the whole sky visible to, to scout. Okay, and so just to, to finish, so I hope I've convinced you that this Faraday rotation effect is quite a, a, um, a very sensitive and um, this is kind of a new tracer or new precise tracer of diffuse magnetized gas from you know scales from the CGM up to the larger scales in the universe um, in these cosmic web filaments. Um, we have this publicly released um, rotation measure grid catalog with LOFAR, which has been used to do interesting science. Um, and we also have this possum um, project ongoing, which is really, you know, going to revolutionize uh, uh, our field. And so, yeah, and I, th I think we're reasonably confident now that these radio data observations in combination with the gamma ray observations really do favor these primordial magnetic field scenarios, which is really exciting for, for yeah, for people who study early universe physics as well. And yeah, we have lots more data in the, in the future. So about three times the area with, with low fire pretty soon by the end of the year. And then we hope to expand this, you know, to the, the very high resolution imaging. Uh, and then we have these exciting um, results from um, coming out from, from these centimeter wavelengths and telescopes, the SKA pathfinders and others. And yeah, and scarily, the SKA is actually now, you know, starting under construction. So it's going to become a reality pretty soon um, towards the, the end of, the end of this decade. Okay. Um, yes, and yeah, and if, if you're interested, yeah, and get involved in the SKA, so Spain is a, a full member of the SKA, so there's lots of opportunities now for people to actually, you know, to lead science projects and to contribute to science projects with the SKA. So do do get in touch. We have, um, yeah, we have this um, SKA cosmic magnetism working group. So if you're interested in cosmic magnetism topics, please do get in touch with. With me or with the um, from the website, you can get the, the emails of the, the co-chairs. And there is a data challenge coming up um, sometime next year. So um, it'll be exciting to, to see what, what we can do with this. Um, and this is very much, um, yeah, at the preliminary stages. So there's nothing defined in terms of exactly, you know, what's, um, um, what we're going to do and who, who has, you know, who gets 
time on the on the, the SK telescope. So this is all to be decided in the next year, in the next years. And and yeah, and so it's a good time to join because also in the middle of next year, there will be an update of the actual science cases um, associated with this, this conference uh, in the middle of next year. Okay, so yeah, thanks for your attention and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shane. So if anyone has any questions or comments, discuss or if there is any information you want to do. Maybe a question um, would be what, what what is the main the main uncertainty or, or the main bias that you may have in measuring these filaments. Uh, um, what would be the, the main uh, uncertainty or bias for measuring the magnetic filament filaments? And yeah, so 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 we worry a little bit about this um this this Milky Way model of the rotation measure that we subtract from our data. Um, but we've done lots of tests, to, you know, to think that we're relatively confident with this. But I think yeah, these new Pathfinder experiments, as we have this very high density of uh, variety rotation measures on the sky, we will be able to constrain the Milky Way contribution much more robustly. And this will, in turn, lead to, to much more robust and more confident conclusions about the contribution from filaments. And then on the other side is the actual local contributions to the sources themselves. And again, we will yeah learn learn a lot. We think we we have it reasonably well understood now based on the combination of studying low far or meter wavelength observations with centimeter wavelength observations. We get an idea of what sources are being probed by by both um, and by both um, wavelength ranges. And yeah, but there's there's still a lot to learn about the local source environments and the Milky Way contribution, and this will then affect. What we conclude about the intergalactic medium. Uh, are you using or can you measure uh, the galactic plane directly? But, but most of the survey is covered outside the, the plane of the Milky Way. But can you infer more information from data under? And um, not, not really. I think I think yeah, the main advances will be at high galactic latitudes and our techniques for subtracting the Milky Way, we know they don't work very well close to the galactic plane. So even when we have these models of the parity rotation of the plane of the Milky Way out to about 20, about 20 degrees from the actual plane itself, you know, you get an excess residual parity rotation that's inconsistent with the um with the, the large um, or with the, the halo. And so yeah, um I don't think we'll it'll be yeah, a long time if ever if we can use um lines of sight through the galactic plane to actually study the extragalactic mirror. Yeah, um, thank you very much. That was that was a that was a very nice talk. Uh, if you could go back to your uh, plot, uh, your slide about the rotation measure grids. With LOFAR or? I think it's way back in the current grid that we showed before with the positive and negative uh, currents. Yeah, exactly. Um, I may be wrong, but it seems to me that the high positive iron values seem to favor some regions. For example, in the upper left corner, for example, is it some kind of is it random or is it some is there some kind of explanation behind that? Yeah, so yeah, it's it's not easy to see in this equatorial projection. So if I change it to galactic coordinates, you will easily see the pattern where you have larger circles as you go towards the galactic plane. So um so this red, so this red region here where the circles get larger and these blue regions here. These are actually closer to the galactic plane than these, these regions here. The, the sign changes are just related to some maybe magnetized bubbles or structures in the Milky Way ISM, what probably quite local to the to, to us. Um, and so yeah, yeah, there's a whole other group of people who study the actual magnetic field properties of the Milky Way in the halo um, um, with these data as well. But yeah, but we're 
we're for the purposes of um our science we're just trying to remove this signal as, as well as possible okay and one question related to that so with the upcoming um sk grid do you expect the southern region to be similar to this or is that going to be different yes it, it will be um many many more data points um so you will be able to map these these filaments you know and these weird yeah, structures a lot more um, in, in a lot more detail. Um, but yes, yeah, so it will. It's basically it'll, the 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 net or the average rotation measure um, will look will have a similar statistical or have similar statistical properties in the southern sky away from the galactic plane. So it's the galactic halos in both sides that are most useful for extragalactic studies because there's not yeah such a complicated contribution. Through the halos, and we hope to that we can remove this um, relatively well. Thank you very much um, again for the coming so, um, and I have, I have um, uh, my, my question is really uh, perhaps related to the splashback uh, idea that you have mentioned there that I don't know if it is related to the QU fitting of the spectra to uh, extract the different components in the uh, rotation measure spectrum. If, am I right on that? You know, so it's the, dis the dispersion that we measure is the dispersion between different lines of sight, so different okay. locations right. on the right. sky. It would be super cool as well. We hope in the future that we will have the dispersion for each individual source. And so then we can have the dispersion of the dispersion, but <laughs> but the dispersion really from the QU fitting will give us the local source properties by and large, uh, the local environment properties. And so this will be a very helpful um, way of checking that we're not we're not making some erroneous yeah, assumptions about the contribution of the local. The, the, the environment of the local sources. Okay. And, and then perhaps, yeah, uh, the second question would be uh, by using the QU uh, fitting that you can uh, differentiate between or uh, between different uh, uh, sources of rotation measure, um, is, is there a technique to use information or redshift so that perhaps you can make a measurement of rotation measure and therefore of magnetic field along the line of sight in, in cosmological distances so that I mean in the end you would be able to construct 3D mapping yeah. of the of the magnetic field. Yeah, so the right. So the so yeah, so people are in yeah investigating this, but the I I, I think it's it's very unlikely um to occur for individual lines of sight because we basically have to get multiple components to be able to separate um the rm structure along the line of sight you need emission at multiple locations along the line of sight and so we only have the polarized emission of the background radio source and then it's only fire the rotation along the entire line of sight if there happens to be synchrotron emission from, say, this diffuse medium in this galaxy group, then yes, we could use the QU fitting to say, OK, the background source has this Faraday rotation measure up until the group. And then the emission from the group, we can separate that and then say, oh, the group has the Faraday rotation signal from, from the group to us. But yeah, the we still end up with the same, a similar problem that we have the whole intergalactic medium between the group and the source and the local source environment. And we have the Milky Way in the foreground. So yeah, I don't think the QU fitting will only help us in understanding the local source contribution because in many cases, we're just averaging over the whole source. And so we might have two lobes. And so you imagine you have two polarized sources and then you're averaging them you know, in a, in a incoherent way within the beam of the telescope. And then this can produce kind of spurious rotation measures in some cases. So there may be a bunch of spurious rotation measures in these data sets that we can actually remove or better quantify with this QU, yeah, this mod, this polarization model fitting. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. So I think I think we have two questions online. Uh, Miguel, can you unmute yourself and? Yeah, can you can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Right. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Shane. Very nice talk. Uh, so I have two questions. Uh, my first one would be, um, it's related to this huge difference between the li limits you are obtaining. So B feels something like less than 0.4 nano, nano gauss. And then you mentioned that there is, you know, 10 to the, it must be larger than 10 to the minus seven nano gauss. So what is then the, what, what do you envision as the ways forward to really constrain better those, those limits or to come to some value that say, well, it is within, I don't know, 10 to the minus two nano gauss. And so is this any? Yes, yeah, so yeah, great, great question. Um, so for magnetic fields in voids, the radio observations, um, I had it somewhere, but I didn't I explicitly say it, they will probably never help us for magnetic fields in voids because the density of gas densities are just too low um, to detect um, appreciable Faraday rotation. However, the Cherenkov telescope array should dramatically improve the, the lower bounds. And so we're hoping that, you know, the Cherenkov telescope array might actually, instead of having a, a lower bound, it might actually detect the magnetic field in these voids. And so that would be super exciting because we would have a detection of magnetic fields in voids from gamma rays and a detection of magnetic fields in filaments with the radio telescopes. And then we really would have, you know, two data points that we could then be fitting, you know, all our primordial magnetic field models to, and we wouldn't be um, working with these lower and upper limits. Oh, that, that that would be lovely. So, and then the other thing is more, you know, of a physical nature, because uh, to be honest, I am a bit lost with this, again, 10 to the minus 7 nanogauss. It's really 10 to the minus 16 gauss. I <laughs> cannot even imagine this. So what is, I mean, what can we learn about maybe inflation, inflation, or you know, in that in more cosmological term, when, when once once you let's say say okay, it's ten to the minus six nanogauss, or it's ten to the minus two. What what are the implications in terms of cosmology? Right, and so yeah, so in the voids, yes, it's ten to the minus six nanogauss. Say, but in the very early universe, um, because of the 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 expansion or just the inverse of this, um, you end up with microgauss level fields you know, during the epoch of inflation or something like this, that some of the models predict magnetic fields that could be <clears throat> strong. And magnetic fields that are this strong in the early universe can actually, you know, they just, it's a plasma and they disturb the plasma. And this, the production of magnetic fields disturbs the plasma and then generates these gravitational waves that might be the actual explanation of the stochastic gravitational wave background. So that's one of the kind of exciting insights that you can gain from um, determining if you know inflationary magnetogenesis models are actually the most likely scenarios. Um, and if they're not, then you end up, um, so these are where you have large amounts of magnetic energy on the largest scales. Um, and then there's the kind of what are called causal mechanisms, which happen a little bit later in the universe, um, during these, what's it called, the electroweak phase transition epochs. So where you have the fields generated, yeah, when you have, you know, matter forming. Um, and, and yeah, so people have models for, you know, magnetic field strings generated during this epoch. And so it gives some insight into whether those theories make sense or not, or, you know, what you have to add to them to, to explain the, the observed level of, of fields. So basically, you know, it's exciting. Uh, yes, these primordial fields, people say they might become a new, you know, extra pillar of cosmology because it helps us probe the physical properties, you know, before the before recombination, basically. And there's very few ways we can actually probe the universe before recombination. Okay, so thanks a lot for the clarifications. Yeah. So my other question is related to this graph that where you show the rotation measure versus redshift for the LOFA data. And you have these different models with alpha being different and then uniform, et cetera. So here with the best fit, you know, which is okay for let's say relatively large redshifts, but at very early redshifts or sorry, small redshifts, you have the, the, the measurements are really way above this, this fit. So is this due to some specific filament? 
Is it just, you know, the, uh, the uncertainties are larger than the ones you, you, you are drawing here? What is going on here at early redshifts? Because even, you know, all the models, no model goes, you know, fits, fits that, or the data doesn't. Exactly. Yes. No, yeah, this is a great point, and I, yeah, I didn't mention it. These wiggles are, well, what we call these wiggles are just the, yeah, the, yeah. the yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's kind it. of jumping around like this. And so we've tried to understand whether these are, you know, real or just statistical fluctuations. They do correspond, the dips correspond to, to over densities in, in um, like the yeah, photometric galaxy counts along the line of sight. But we can't really, at the moment, come up with a, a plausible model for to explain them in terms of, you know, the magnetic field um, properties or the gas properties along the line of sight. So what's not what's not in these simulations are like, you know, so some, some sort of supercluster along the line of sight or the local contributions of the sources themselves. So that's what we may be, yeah, um, still maybe remaining in our data at the lowest redshifts. Um, where we have possibly the largest you know, contribution from the, the local source environments. And because what you cannot see here very well was this pink one was an effort to have this astrophysical model combined with a primordial one. And the pink one has this excess at low redshift relative to the blue one, which is just the primordial one. And this was an effort to try and see, oh, can we get a higher value to actually explain the data? And at the moment, yeah, we cannot. So we're still unsure at these lowest redshifts, um, yeah, what the explanation for this, this excess might be. Um, and yeah, it's exciting if these actual wiggles are real. And so then it can actually tell us something about, you know, the 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 um yeah, the structure of the the universe um at these, you know, um lower, lower redshifts. Thanks a lot. Very nice. Thank you. Okay, I think we have a last question from Janis. Yes, thank you very much, Shane, for the nice talk uh, and the very interesting results. So my question is about the LOFAR RMs. Um, you mentioned that they are sensitive to the lower values and also they have much less uncertainty. This is very interesting. And I, I like what you said, that it's a filter for the high higher density structures. So I understand that higher densities and higher magnetic fields both can cause higher rotation measures that would depolarize uh, the lower signal. My question is, do you think, from your experience, is there any possibility to differentiate between, to, to disentangle the two uh, sources of uh, increasing the rotation measure, namely the density and the magnetic field, for example, um, from, from, from your experience in LOFAR? Ah, so, so this is what we, we try to do with the estimates of magnetic fields, if I understand your question correctly. That, yeah, so the rotation measure is the integral quantity of the density and the field. So we just get yeah that combined quantity as the measurement. And then all our magnetic field estimates are model-dependent estimates, because it's a model of the electron density, which is kind of easier to model because we know a lot more about the gas density properties of the universe. And so there's several ways of going about this. The more, most complicated way is using the densities from the cosmological simulations. So we get you know, a statistical estimate of the, the density along a particular line of sight. So doing it for individual lines of sight, I think, is, is very challenging. Um, so most likely, we'll just be able to say you know, statistical things about um, you know, the magnetic field properties of at a certain over density. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. My question was on the on the more on the observational side, so not on, st on a statistical phase, but you see these radio galaxies that you have signal on the outskirts because the density, the magnetic field probably drops, but at some point towards the core, you you lose the polarized signal, and this can happen with both reasons. And my, yeah, my question is if you have looked into this more line of sight dependence of the uh, disentangling these two effects. Yes, so um, individual sources, yeah, or, or yes, or... right, yeah. So uh, what what we will need to do is combine the low far or meter wavelength observations with centimeter wavelength observations. So the meter wavelength observations will just give us the small patches where the the depolarization is very low, and then the centimeter wavelengths will allow us to map 
you know, almost the full Faraday structure of individual radio galaxies. And so we can actually select, even in the centimeter wavelength observations now with the likes of Possum, we will be able to select sources that have similar, you know, depolarization properties as low far so that we can actually, yeah, cross check our understanding of, of whether, yeah, the, whether we understand the, the rotation measure properties of the population of sources that we're detecting with low far. Um, and yeah, for individual source studies, the centimeter wavelengths are still probably better because they will detect the, the Faraday structure, you know, of the whole, the whole source itself. Thank you. Yeah. This combined analysis, it looks interesting. Thank you very much. Hey, I don't think there are any other questions. So uh, thank you, Shane. I think we can, we can thank uh, the speaker again. Thank you.